over sort of like all substances. So this has been observed for a long time in physics. Um, and it, there's something sort of seemingly universal there. In particular, Uhlenbeck said that um, these are gen general phenomena, and so they should have a general explanation. Um, and in particular, even intermolecular forces shouldn't come into play. Um, or at least the attractive intermolecular force shouldn't come into play at high pressure um, because the pressure is exerting much greater force in that way than the, the, any attraction that you could have between molecules. So these sharp repulsive forces um, maybe are responsible for the solid fluid transition. And as early as, I think, 1941, Kirkwood asked if a hard sphere is gas, a sort of you know, abstraction of, of matter to a sort of mathematical model, would exhibit a phase transition. And so people, I think people have studied this probably many different ways, including taking you know, a bunch of uh, ball bearings and um, oiling them up and just sort of squeezing them. Um, and looking at the patterns that the balls make in a container. But um, some of the most interesting experiments are just done on uh, computer simulations. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, so so we'll, the rest of the talk will really be confined to the two-dimensional version of hard spheres, which is the hard disks model. And um, of course, there's a huge literature uh, in physics on dimensions three and also dimensions four and higher. The computer simulations don't mind uh, doing four-dimensional or five-dimensional spheres, of course. So, um, so once the, the disks take up about 71% of the area, the structure becomes much more lattice-like. So first of all, compare this number 71% to the uh, densest possible packing of disks which has been known since uh, maybe 1950 or so due to Laszlo uh, Fejas Tote to be, um, well, proved by him, although probably known for a very long time, um, to be the hexagonal lattice. Um, if you put this into the disks along the hexagonal lattice, you get the densest packing. And, and that number gives you like pi over root 12, which ends up being about 90.69%. So this is, is far away from the densest po possible packing. And something happens there. They, the statistical mechanics people know this through computer simulations. Mathematicians really seem to have no idea what happens there. So, um, so maybe this is a little bit of a too much leading example, but I think it's pretty pictures. Um, and these are by uh, Werner Krauth, who's, who's one of the world's experts in computational statistical physics actually simulating these things on computers is a whole art and science. OK, so now you can sort of believe it looks like these things are starting to get closer to that hexagonal packing here where the relative density is about 72%, uh, eyeballing it. But of course, they're not eyeballing it when they do their experiments. Well, they're probably also eyeballing it. But um, they, they can make this quantitative. So uh, one version would be to look at the hexatic structure. And uh, this is um, just looking at the sort of local angles and seeing how close they are to equally spaced. So, so now capital N here is the number of disks we have. And um, NJ is the number of um, neighbors the jth disk has. And then we, um, we sum up you know, e to the 6i, theta jk, uh, where you shift the origin to particle j here and look at the angle that particle k makes there. Um, and so we sort of, um, you sum that over the nj neighbors. By the way, uh, full disclosure, I've, I've been trying to get a straight answer from somebody about what the definition, exact definition of neighbors of the jth particle is here. and. I'm, I'm not exactly sure on that. I mean, you, I think you could say, for example, pick the six closest disks to this, but that's not what they're doing if they're summing over different numbers. So I think what's more likely is that they're taking everything within that's close to this disk. Um, so there's some threshold radius, but I don't know what that is or how they decide what's a good number there. Um, 
So the idea is if this is close to a hexatic structure, these terms here are going to line up and this vector is going to point in um, the same way and this whole sum, once you take its magnitude, is going to be large. And so what they actually see is... Uh, Where's the x dependence on the right-hand side? Sorry. Where's the what dependence? Uh, x dependence, I see. Back. It's uh, a function of x on the left. The left is like a vector. Oh, sorry. X, x is the whole configuration. That's the position of all n disks. That's uh, all in disks, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so x is the configuration here. So in, in particular, we could record, this, is, this will be part of the point of the talk, we could record a position of n disks in, say, uh, a region in the plane um, with one point in r to the 2n. So, so for that reason, the space of all allowable configurations um, is uh, endowed with a natural topology as a subset of R2n and also with a natural measure. Okay. So, so here's what you don't do um, to get one of these pictures. Uh, one way would just be to throw down a bunch of random disks and this, if two of them overlap, then reject. And if no pair of them overlaps, then accept. Of course, that's the mathematical right definition. That, that is the measure that we're talking about here with, with respect to that energy potential function that we talked about. The only thing that matters is that um, none of the disks overlap. So we're giving every sort of configuration like that equal probability. You want really that measure that you get as a subset of R2n. So you could just throw the disk down, and if any pair overlaps, then um, reject otherwise accept. But the problem is that in the whole age of the universe, you'll never get one point in your space that you're trying to sample from. So what you do is, uh, instead, you start with an arbitrary configuration that the thought is, the ergodic hypothesis would say, it doesn't really matter where you start. And um, now take a random walk on the space. Of course, Markov chain Monte Carlo is ubiquitous in probability, and especially for its applications for this sort of thing. Um, highly recommend uh, Percy Diaconis's recent survey article on uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo revolution that has a nice section about exactly this, about the hard disks uh, se setting. Um, so here's what you do. Start with your sort of, say, lattice configuration of disks. Now pick one of the end disks and perturb it within a small epsilon neighborhood. And if it results in overlap or going out of bounds, reject the move and otherwise accept it and just uh, repeat. And so this should, this, in some sense, provably converges to the stationary distribution as the number of steps goes to infinity. By the way, it's, it's sort of expected that if um, you could give all of the um, disks, you know, velocities randomly and, you know, get them all bouncing around and that that sort of Newtonian version um, should also converge to the stationary distribution um, but ergodicity is um, hard to come by. And in fact, a celebrated result of um, Sinai uh, proves something like that for like two disks or something, proves that you get something ergodic. Um, so in, in general, ergodicity is sort of um, tough to come by in this field. And, um, no, it's not. And thanks for that point, because that's something that I want to talk about next. So, yeah, it's not obvious that it's connected, although th I think that the theoretical chemists and statistical physicists treat it as if that is obvious, and that, I think that should bother us a little bit as mathematicians, but I'm not sure how much that should bother us. So we'll talk about that. So, so here's one question that's a little bit related to that. <laughs> how long do we have to... Um, do this, you know, pick one disk, move it a little bit, pick one disk, move it a little bit, um, bef you know, before the disks are mixed. So the mixing time at Markov chains is a huge subject. Uh, Percy is, uh, you know, one of the people who's well known in that field. And they, they actually studied the general, uh, general form of the Metropolis algorithm and put some of the first useful upper bounds on the mixing time. And then they sat down and applied the results to this great classical statistical mechanics problem and said, well, how long do we have to shuffle before hard disks are really mixed up? 
And they got something, you know, some exponential time or something said, well, that, that's good. At least it's only exponential time and they're mixed up. But they needed to make sure that the disks were really small, like R is big O, one over N. So how, how small is that? You're thinking that the disks only have length in the limit, not, not area, right? So, so the total, so we're going to think of this from now on in a unit box, um, zero, zero, 01 to zero, 01. And R is the radius of the disks, and N is the number of disks. So, um, so where everything is happening, the, the so-called thermodynamic limit is where pi R squared N is a constant. You know, N times pi R squared is the total area of the disks, and if that's some fraction. But here, you know, pi R squared N is going to zero um, pretty quickly. So these, the disks have total length in the limit, but not total area. So that's pretty small, and they, they were a little disappointed that they, their results for mixing time didn't hold all the way up into the thermodynamic limit, because they did some hard work on the mixing time. Um, and this is uh, some really technical work in probability involving microlocal analysis and a lot of things that have nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about today. It would be nice to see their results extend into the thermodynamic limit, but in their paper it doesn't. And you know, just talking to Percy, they, they were a little disappointed about that. Um, and in particular, they needed that at least to make sure that the space was connected. And that's the minimum thing you need to ensure that a Markov process is ergodic. Okay, so it'd be nice to extend the results to a denser regime. Um, and so one question, first question is, is that possible? So here's a um, definition from the sort of classical and I think sphere packing. This is, uh, I think, what Fayez Tote and people of his generation called it. They said a configuration of disks or circles is stable if each one's held in place by its neighbors, which is nice because that's just something that you can check locally. So this is, by the way, uh, I think uh, equivalent to what Sal Terquato and people in, um, who study jammed hard particle packings and from the point of view of physics, what they would call locally jammed. Okay, so, so a stable configuration is one then that can't make any moves in that metropolis algorithm because we're only moving one disk at a time. So, so I was going through, I had been thinking about this question of Percy's for a year or two, and then I was flipping through a discrete geometry book um, by Janusz Pak and Mika Scherer, and I found uh, an article addressing this uh, beautiful old question of Fayez Tote. Um, what's the smallest density you can have for a stable configuration of disks in the plane? And Borowski's solution to this. So, um, so here's one kind of stable packing in the plane. Um, it's well known that the plane can be tiled by, tiled by regular 12 gons and equilateral triangles. And, um, and then if you put disks at the, every one of those vertices, you get something taking up 38% of the plane or something. Maybe my next slide says 39%. So is this minimal? Unfortunately, people are still conjecturing today that this thing is minimal, even though it's been known for a uh, long time that that's not the case. But if you looked at like Wolfram's Math World, you know, article on disk packing right now, this is the picture you'll find as the conjectural minimal stable packing in the plane. But uh, I mean, I think it's just that this work of Brodsky actually deserves to be better known. So please allow me to advertise it. So here's Borowski's bridge. Um, so he starts with these five shaded disks on the left side. And then there's going to be a curve along the top. And all the centers of the disks labeled A um, are going to be along that curve. Now what this curve is going to be is, um, so this point here is at um, 2 plus square root of 3. It's y coordinate. The limit as you go along that curve, as you go to infinity, is 2 times square root of 3, which is just slightly smaller than 2 plus square root of 3. And then um, th we only need a couple other conditions on that curve, that um, its first derivative be negative and that its second derivative be positive. There's lots of functions that do that. So the next comment is this whole construction will be symmetric about the x-axis. So I just have to tell you what happens at the top, and then you know what happens at the bottom. <laughs> 
So we started with these five disks and we put the A's along there. Now I'll put in B2 so it's tangent to A2 and C1. Now C2 centered on the x-axis, tangent to B2. Now B3 is tangent to A3 and C2. C3 on the x-axis, tangent to B3, and so on. And there's something to check here that this construction actually works and is con continues to infinity. Um, and maybe it's not pleasant to check it, and I certainly won't do it in a talk, but it's, also, it's very elementary. So um, there's no problem there. So now we've got something that almost looks stable, except for these disks on the end, right? Since this is convex, this disk can't get out. But the only disk that can move are the disks on the end. So then you think, well, maybe we could flip it over the y-axis and get something two-way infinite. But you're still left, that's better. Now instead of five disks that are loose, we still have two disks that are loose, the top and the bottom. So Brodsky has uh, a next very pretty idea which is to put them together, not in a two-way infinite way, but three-way infinite. So here's this little piece, and they're glued along here. And now he's got something that's three-way infinite, and uh, it's stable. No disk can move. Everything's held in place. And so in the whole plane, this is zero density, right? <laughs> These things have length, not area. So it's surprising a little bit. I mean. You can even sit down, and if you hadn't seen this, you, you can hypothetically sit down and spend a long time trying to prove that something like this can't happen, but um, it can, and so your proofs will be fruitless. Um, your attempt at proving will be fruitless. So, um, so this, the, the great Fayez Tote um, didn't know that there were zero density stable configurations, and Borowski gave such examples. So, um, so then I saw this after having been thinking about this problem for a while, and I thought that was solid gold, uh, Borowski's picture. And it's actually not hard to adapt it to the square. First of all, in Janusz Pak and Mika Schreer's um, book, they already had adapted it for another reason to a symmetric version. And you can make this bridge sort of as long as, as you'd like, but now it's finite, and now it's symmetric. Um, and then I came up with this corner junction uh, for put, pasting those together. And so now you can put them in the square. One thing I like about this construction is you see it actually doesn't even touch the boundary of the square um, except at the corners. You don't even need the boundary to hold it in place. <laughs> they're, they're, they're really stuck. Um, so, so the answer to Percy's question is, um, you can't do better than what they did in their paper. At least up to the constant in front, um, if you can only move one disk at a time, of course that's a very restrictive kind of move, but that's the simplest version of the Metropolis algorithm, and it's, um, it's classical, it's very well studied, and it's still not completely understood, even that scenario of moving one disk at a time. They have something about the mixing time, but their result is, best possible, at least in terms of saying something sensible about mixing time, if you're restricting to that sort of thing. Um, okay, so now let's talk about this more generally. Uh, configuration space, um, let's just define it to be this, um, uh, formally. Um, so each of the x ends is the is a point in the unit square. And the fact that he's in R1 <coughs> minus R squared just ensures that uh, disk of radius R doesn't go out of boundary, and then the distance between them is at least 2R, so none of the disks overlap. So that's exactly all arrangements in the square. And that inherits the measure that we've been talking about, and also a subspace topology. I should say, the, so we talked about how to sample from that, but what is, that, what is the volume of that space, say, as, as a subset of Euclidean space? That's, no one knows anything about that. And um, I love this quote by uh, Giancarlo Rota. He said, if we knew what the volume of that space was, say, as a function of N and R, we would know, for example, why water boils at 100 degrees on the basis of purely atomic calculations. I don't know if that's really true, but I, <laughs> I like that, that Rhoda, so, so I think it's a definition. It's a definition? That's the, 
but that's the definition, but on the basis of purely atomic calculations. That's a good point, Mark. We know why water boils at 100 degrees on the basis of much simpler. Good. Um, so so um, if you make R really small, a really small, say, function of n, you can understand the volume of this space. But as you get up into the thermodynamic limit, it's, um, it's hard to measure that or even come up with a good estimate. OK, so, so this was an interesting, uh, this dispacking configuration that we came up with was, um, I think, a sort of fun counterexample. And I, um, but I want to try to tell you about these jam configurations being mathematically interesting. Um, so the first reason is it limits what you could prove about, say, mixing time of Markov chains in the sense that we've been talking about. But what I think actually makes them more interesting um, is um, that I, I think these jammed and semi-jammed um, configurations of disks are um, something like critical points of a Morse function, and that those are signposts for where the topology of the configuration space changes. So that's really what the rest of this talk is about, is to um, give uh, some examples of that. We'll have some theorems and a little bit of speculation. So uh, I was a postdoc at Stanford, and Gunnar Carlson, of course, has a whole program of computational topology now. And I had an undergraduate researcher, uh, Jackson Gorham, who came to me asking for a project. So um, in the meantime, I had been thinking about this problem that Percy had suggested about what's the topology of these configuration spaces. So we came up with a, a sort of computational implementation of Morse theory to try to get a handle on just how the connected components um, behave uh, for a small number of disks. So pi naught here is the set of path components. Um, and we're interested in that, how that structure changes are vary. So not just the number of path components, but which path components come together and merge as, as R shrinks or something like that. So um, I'm not sure if this is standard in the homotopy theory literature or not, but Gunnar calls this uh, dendrogram um, for persistent homotopy theory. So, um, so I'll show you the dendrogram at the end, and then maybe we'll know what that, what that thing is by example. So our idea is a computational implementation of Morse theory, at least to uh, recover a, like a one skeleton of something. So config n here, I just mean let's look at just n distinct points in unit square. You are thinking of that as the union of all these configuration spaces, nr for positive r. So of course, um, topologists and geometers in the room know that that configuration space is very well studied and very well understood from different points of view. Um, so that's not just joint union, it's a union uh, continuum. Yeah, that's a, you can um, just, so each one of these um, config in R's includes into that big config in. So then if we, so we can think of a function on, on that can big configuration space, the classical configuration space, that's just this min. Take the min distance between a pair of points, what divided by two, or distance to the boundary. And um, you're looking at the super level sets of that. Does it matter that you're looking at this bounded domain? Is it corresponding to the tree on Um. Right, that's a good question. So in, uh, in simulations, for example, and um, computer simulations, statistical mechanics, I think frequently they prefer the torus. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is actually in the square. Um, so with the specific examples I'll talk about, um, things will be very different. You know, If you're looking at just two or three disks and how they behave in a square versus in a torus, the answer is going to be very different. Of course, we might guess that um, you know if you've got ends going to infinity, and, um, that the the boundary condition shouldn't matter too much. Um, so for things like asymptotically, I would guess that, but can't prove that the torus should behave the same as the square. But for us today, we'll be talking about it in the square. 
and for small numbers of disks, the answer will, will change. So we, we have this function here that's min, and it's smooth most places, but it's not smooth everywhere. So um, the, the nicest version or easiest version of Morse theory of like a smooth version, smooth <coughs> function on a compact manifold or something won't work. But um, we're going to approximate it by a smooth function. So now uh, we'll look at sublevel sets instead of super level sets since we want to do Morse theory. And I sort of took reciprocals of everything on the previous side. And now I'm just going to put everything to the h power. And um, h will be a hardness parameter. Um, so the idea is that for large h, this should be like um, hard disks. So I should get a version of this with h really small, like 2. I think this is h at about 10. And what we're doing is we're flowing along. We start with 50 random points, and we flow along the gradient um, of, that, of this energy function. So here, these are pretty soft. h is about 10. Um, let's see. And here, h is like 50. And it actually takes a lot longer for this to converge, even though they're taking the same step size. I, I mean, my heuristic reason for that is that um, because the H perimeter is so big there, you're really only penalizing one disk at a time. And so only sort of one disk is moving, and then another disk moves, and one moves. Where when H is smaller and the disks are softer, you can move a lot of disks at once. So this thing keeps going for a while. I won't subject you to the whole thing. But um, these disks can, can overlap a little bit, right? Um, no, so, what I'm, so these are really points in the square. And then I just tell the computer to draw the circles as big as they can without overlapping. Oh. And, and then I gave them some thickness. So they, it looks like they overlap a little bit at their boundary. But I'm making it as big as possible without them overlapping. Um, yes, um, but I'm thinking of that energy functional on the whole configuration space. So it's sort of as if we're going to ignore radius for a minute, and then radius will come back in. So, so when, when I'm thinking of points, they, I'm just thinking of n points in the, in the square, and they, they don't overlap because um, they're just points. And then with those points, I can flow along the gradient of this energy. So. Um, so now we'll find local minimums with respect to that energy gradient. And then the, most of the effort is then actually finding low energy paths between those low energy points. And this comes from the nudged elastic band method. And it's somewhat fitting that this, w the nudged elastic band method is very much a sort of Morse theoretic thing if you're, if you're trained in math and topology in particular. But the people who came up with it are theoretical chemists. Um, and they, they want to find um, in their space sort of semi-stable equilibria that might correspond geometrically if you thought of a potential energy function on some configuration space. Those things might correspond to some kind of saddle points. So, so we did this experiment. And let me just show you what it, what it looks like. So, so now I'm going to go back to radius. Um, so the, my local minimums, if I start, oh, so we did this experiment with five disks. And I want to try to show how rich the structure can be, even with five disks, and just looking at the number of path components. We're not looking at the higher topology yet. Um, so, so five disks, the smallest, um, the radius, sorry, the largest the radius can be is here. And that cor these things correspond to local energy minimums of that function. So then the next kind of uh, local min that we get is these. So by the way, we start with like tens of thousands of sets of five points in the square and flow along the gradient of this function. We only end up seeing a few different types of local minimums, local energy minimums. And these are the first two. So, so we would think that this is 120 um, different path components because five factorial disks. I'm thinking of the disks as labeled. And now there's another 480 because 5 factorial times 4 corners. Um, so now we've got 600 components. And as we shrink the disk, these things should be able to connect to each other. 
So the low energy path, the first interesting thing that happens looks like this. Um, so let me show you a picture. I want to get from one pin. Yes, this is all computer experiment, this whole section of the talk. So, so, in, so here's um, going from one pentagon to another pentagon. This is actually just with that energy functional and using the nudged elastic band method. And I made the uh, MATLAB change the color of the disks when they're at their smallest radius. Now this is actually a mathematically interesting disk packing. Um, it's what they would call on the jammed hard particle packings. These disks are locally jammed, or what I was calling earlier stable, um, but they're not collectively jammed. So those five disks, no single disk can move, but as we just saw them get into this position, all five can move together, either rotating one way, in which case this one will go in the corner, or rotating the other way, where maybe that one goes in the corner, if we're going to local mend. Yeah. So they went from a large radius to a smaller radius where, where the two fast tempos come together and then back to a larger radius again? Yeah, so what we're really doing is we found the computer experiment, we're forgetting about radius for a minute. We find local energy minimums of this energy function. So one well, one um, local energy min looked like that, and another one looked like that. At the same radius. And they, they're at the same energy. Yeah. And then, now I want to find a low energy path between them. So I want to find a path such that the max, it, so I've got to go up to get out of the, low, the energy wells. And so um, what's the lowest energy path I can do that, where the energy of path is just the max energy along. And so, um, so this should be like an index one critical point if, if we think of that as a Morse function. So, um, so, so that's actually how these things, so the first thing that happens is 480 components collapses down to 24 um, via edges that, you know, I'm uh, illustrating with just that one, that critical point on the edge. And so why is it 24? Well, so I can slide along an edge and go from one corner to the next. And then how, if I just keep doing that, how long does it take me to get back around? It takes 20 moves like that. <laughs> it's basically because there's four corners of the square and five different disks. So it's actually a 20 cycle. And if I had to guess, I'd say that there's a very short window here that there's um, these 24, these, so these 480 components are all contractible. And then here for a short window, we should have 24 components that have the homotopy type of a circle. That, that would be a guess. So this is all. This is still the computer experiment, and we'll get back to math in a minute. Um, so then the next thing that happens is um, another kind of what I would call index one uh, critical point. And um, this is subtle. It's like, what's the easiest way to get from um, this packing to this packing? Um, you have to shrink the disks, because these are both um, rigid. and um, this actually ends up being the answer. If you twist this thing counterclockwise, it pops out into a configuration like this. And if you twist them clockwise, it pops into a configuration like this. So let me show you a movie of that. Um, So again, the, the nudged elastic band is finding us these sort of semi-jammed configurations, what I would call index one critical points. Um, OK, so then the last thing that happens is that you can pop back out of this. So, so now we did this computer experiment, but to put it on this picture, I went back to radius. And based on a lot of calculation that Jackson did over the course of a year, a lot of MATLAB code, and then um, kind of going back and revisiting some of those calculations recently, I, I would guess that this is what happens for persistent pi naught for five disks. I think we start with zero components. It's empty if the disks are too big. 
and then you get um, 120, then 600, 144, 1, 481, 1. And um, so if the disks are small enough, by the way, of course, they'll act like points, and you'll get the right, you'll get the classical homotopy type configuration space. Where that's going to happen is down here at like 1 over r equals 10. So there's actually lots of changes in the topology for five disks, which I'll try to suggest in the remaining time of the talk. This is the, just the coarse first level view. We're just looking at a one skeleton. And I'd guess, uh, but I wouldn't bet my life on it, that this is probably the right picture for uh, the one skeleton. You're saying, first of all, if the disk is small enough, there's only one path container, right? Because you can just move everything around. But you're also saying somewhere in the middle here, there's a region where there's only one path container. That's right. So, so perhaps surprisingly, the property of path connected is not a monotone property. Also, the number of path components is not a monotone. So these are all sort of counterexamples to conjectures you, that one might make about these configuration spaces and how they change with R. So even with five disks and even just looking at pi naught, I think there was some surprises for us. Um, OK, so let's talk about what we can say in general, especially um, in the end, what we're going to care about is as n goes to infinity, if we really care about the statistical mechanics. But I just think these are, this leads to a lot of attractive um, points and uh, questions in topology. So here's, here's everything that happens for three disks in some sense. The critical values, these are the only radius where the topology changes. So I'll try to convince you in the next few minutes that um, for three disks, as you vary the radius from um, infinity to zero, the topology changes exactly four times up to homotopy type. OK? So now I would speculate. I don't know if there's a complete list for four disks yet. I think this is a, a nice, oh, by the way, I've arranged these as sort of like what I think of as index of the critical point. So this is index zero. These are the only uh, truly jammed configurations. And these have like a degree of freedom. Um, and that has sort of two degrees of freedom. And this isn't even really a critical point. It's not an isolated um, critical point in a more theoretic sense. Maybe it's a critical submanifold because you can slide those disks up and down. Um, but we'll, we'll make more sense of this in a minute. Yeah, I, I want to make sure I uh, are, you, are you still using this energy? No, no. So now, we'll like, now we're getting back to um, uh, just what can we prove mathematically. And I, I'm, I'm claiming that these are sort of critical points of a Morse function. But I just mean that so far, um, and for, for the purposes of today's talk, and uh, in spirit, I don't want to say well, really, the function that we're dealing with now is just that min function that I was talking about. We want to talk about these configuration spaces of hard disks on the nose. And of course, you can't, what, but all I, all I observed earlier was that that's not a smooth function on a compact manifold. But uh, as people in this audience are well aware, you can do Morse theory in lots of settings that aren't smooth functions on compact manifolds. For example, stratified Morse theory. And um, there's some people have written down something that they call min type Morse theory, where you've got min of a bunch of functions that are Morse functions. And they show that you can get some, some Morse theory there. And uh, there's uh, discrete Morse theory for regular cell complexes, things like that. So, um, so now I just want, so I'm saying if we just, now we're just talking about radius of disks and hard spheres. My claim would be three disks in the box. The topology changes exactly four times. Four disks, I think it changes about nine or 10 times. Five disks, I think it changes a lot. And I'm pretty sure this is an incomplete list of critical points and that not all their indices are right. So, um, so let me get back to three disks. Um, so, so I showed you that there was only a few critical values, but something that we've been wanting for a while, and I think that um, we've, I finally maybe have af after some nice conversations with Bob McPherson, is a cell structure for these. Um, so, so here's zero cells, one-dimensional cells, two-dimensional cells, and three-dimensional cells. And the number underneath it tells you how many of those there are. So here there's four, because 
it could go in any of the four corners, or here it's four because there's four sides. You know, there's different combinatorics for each of those. The symmetries of the square are coming into play. What we're ignoring here is the symmetries of permuting the disks. So really, I, since I'm liking to think of these as uh, labeled or ordered configuration spaces, um, you've got all these cells and then multiply by three factorial or six. So in the end, just for the configuration space of three disks, you get a cell structure with 2,000 or 3,000 cells. So, okay, so let's. So, so here's all the cells for the whole configuration space as the. Um, that, that's right. And so, so we could come up with a cell structure for the whole configuration space, you know, where there are like points with um, a lot less cells. But the nice thing about this cell structure is we'll be able to take subsets of these cells um, and get it at every, at every point. So. Uh huh. So, so these are index zero, one, so two, and three. Let's take one guy in the second row. You're telling me there's a one-dimensional space of deformations of that. Yeah. So you, it's you can see it. Um, like this guy, if you shrink the disk, so think that again we're going over all possible radius. Um, so um, if you shrink this radius, um, you end up a vertex looks like that. It, um, and, and if you expand the radius, the other end of the vertex, well, it looks like this, but rotated. And so every one of these, so you know, this is, a, this is an edge that's actually an interesting edge that's a little different than the other ones. <laughs> On one end, it looks like uh, this corner, and the other end, it looks like this corner. And so I'll show you some little more detailed pictures here. Um, so my, my claim is, let's, let's take a closer look at this two-dimensional cell. And maybe this will answer some of your questions, yeah? Is this, does it say there's four components, or what is it? Uh, what is it? Four? There, there's four cells like that because there's um, four sides of the square. I mean, where, where does it go? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to index the cells of the structure by these pictures. So, so I don't want to draw this picture four times, but you understand the symmetries of the square are coming into play. But really, if I'm looking at the label configuration space, that would be 24, not 4, because there's an extra factor of 6. So let's see how these things start to break down a little bit. So let's look at this two-dimensional cell, and, and what is it? So every time you add uh, another edge in this graph, in this tangency graph, you're going to drop the dimension by 1. And there's a few different ways you can do that here, actually 5. So here's our, my two-dimensional cell. I'm claiming it's actually its boundary is a pentagon. So there's, there's all the zero-dimensional cells that are on its boundary, and those are all the one-dimensional cells. And sort of um, these, each one of these goes between two of those. So I'll show you one of the three-dimensional cells. Um, that picture on the left, that's the three-dimensional cell. We want to understand how these pieces fit together. Um, there's the four vertices. Um, Here's the six edges, and there's the four two-dimensional faces. So you're saying you complete the boundary max between these cell counts. So you complete the homology of that. Yeah. So and and for all radius, like like in principle at least. So so the the nice thing is now I think we have a cell structure uh, that will work for all radius, in principle for any n, but um, it's. That's the good news. The bad news is we already have like almost 3,000 cells when we have three disks. So, um, so with four disks, just getting how, all the different types. So look at the compare. Um, these, are, these are the most important things for three disks. But when we wanted a whole cell structure, we had to get a lot more. So for four disks, the picture looks like this as far as what I think the critical points are. Um, but if we want the whole cell structure, we're gonna, there's going to be a whole lot more that's going to happen here. So, but um, fortunately, I, I don't do um, algebraic or enumerative combinatorics, and I'm not especially interested in counting things exactly. I'm mostly interested in 
asymptotic or probabilistic combinatorics and counting things asymptotically. So I, I still hold out that there's some hope for making use of this cell structure for large um, n. Okay, so just to review three disks though, in that cell structure, here's what happens homotopy type. So if the disks are too big, the space is empty. <laughs> now we shrink the disk a little bit and we get four corners times six orderings of the disk, 24 contractible components. Then if you shrink them a little bit more, um, you get down to two circles, it turns out. And you can think of that, so yeah, if you've got disks one, two, three, you see disk two starting to move down. And you can sort of rotate them around as much as you want, but you can't change the orientation. You can't change one, two, three to one, three, two. So that ends up being two circles. You shrink the disk a little bit more. Um, <laughs> This is not obvious at all, but this is what it works out to be. You get uh, a wedge of 13 circles here. Um, you can give it a graph structure if you want. Um, it's got 24 vertices, and it's regular of degree 3. Is, it, is there anything in between there? No. <laughs> so this is the only time the homotopy changes, except there's, there's one more. And then, and then once, so I'm telling you what the threshold radius is. We could figure out exactly what the radius is when this comes in, and then you get a non-empty space, and it's got 24 contractible components. Shrink them a little bit more. Here, I guess the radius is one quarter. Homotopy type is two circles, and it'll be two circles all the way up until here. Homotopy type changes again. So even though there was a lot of cells, um, the topology only changed a small number of times, and so that's another thing that gives me hope. Um, so let me kind of uh, put, put a few um, questions out there for the future. One, as far as the computational side of things, I, I think people have thought about this. Higher dimensional versions of the nudge elastic band method would be nice for a lot of reasons. If we could find higher index critical points, everything that I showed you for three, four, and five disks we found by hand. Um, or let's say you find something like that, a critical point by hand, now could you compute its index? Just say how the topology changes at that point. Um, just trying to plug, go back to that smooth approximation idea and just compute a, a Hessian matrix. Um, I, so far, I haven't really always gotten the right answer for things where I thought I already knew what the index was. So even this, I think, finding the critical points is probably computationally hard. And even given one, finding its index is probably um, not easy either. So, so here's one question is, what's the class threshold for classical homotopy type? And Yuli Baryshnikov and Peter Bubnik and I were able to show that what you're going to get classical homotopy type for endpoints in the square once they're small enough that their total length is um, one side of the square. Um, so that, that's a threshold, a sharp threshold. We know that that's the right answer. So I'll leave, skip through that in the interest of time. Here's another question. Um, that I think is maybe interesting, asymptotically studying these, try to measure the topological complexity. I don't expect that we should be able to say what every homology group is um, for every N and R uh, in some particularly nice way. So can we do some course, what was that? So, I, but I, no, I, I wanna let N go to infinity, say. I would number of disks go to infinity. And so then the dimension will be, well, about N. Um, up to homotopy type. So, so here's one coarse measure of topological complexity would just be the sum of the Betty numbers. Okay, so we could think of other coarse measures, but this is one. And um, Yuli and I uh, have some bounds on this. We know the rough rate of growth. So first of all, take the sum of the Betty numbers. The max over all R for some fixed n. Now divide by n factorial, that's just the reordering the disks. Then the theorem is that that number grows exponentially. You know, if you take the log, it's actually between some constant C1 and C2. Um, so to get a lower bound, we use rigid disk packing constructions again. This is different than the one I showed you, the Borowski configuration adapted to the square at the beginning. Um, that one is actually not globally rigid. Um, the Metropolis algorithm can't move, but lots of disks can move if you allow them at once. But this one, it seems, um, there's no infinitesimal motions. This, this is actually an isolated point. So it's not just betting not that can be big, though. 
because there's room to play. You can put extra distance here. Now that's homotopy type of a circle, homotopy type of a circle. So you've got a bunch of S1s times each other. So you've actually got high dimensional torus components and you get exponentially many of them. So it's not just that we can make the sum of the Betty numbers big. We can make Betty not big. We can make Betty K big when K is a fraction of N and so on. Um, to get an upper bound on the Betty numbers, um, Milner Tome, or um, actually even just Bayes-Uts theorem, tells us something um, together with the fact, I think it's the old theorem of Pat, maybe, there's only exponentially many planar graphs on N vertices. Um, okay, so just close with some open questions. Just to point out how little we know about the topology of these spaces, we still don't even know what's the threshold for the space to become connected and, you know, and stay connected. Um, yeah, bounds though? I don't think interesting bounds. I mean, I could, I could say something, but they would not be interesting. I, I can say, by the way, that there is, you can observe that there's what I would call a topological giant component, which is that um, if you shrink the disks a little bit, um, you get out of any stuck configurations. And in fact, the image of your whole space in that configuration space of smaller radius that you're including into, um, it's all in one path component. So let's call that path component the topological giant component. It would be nice to say, show that that's also a measure theoretic giant component. But so, um, so that happens sort of right at the, uh, at very close to the, the densest packing. You, you've already got a topological giant component that'll be there for all time and will eventually be the one component. But I don't know what, what the threshold is. Um, I don't have good bounds on that. It might not be the right question, but it's just, it's a sensible math question. I, I don't know the answer to. Here's something that I think is more interesting is the diameter of this configuration space with respect to your favorite metric. Um, let's say the diameter of the giant component in this or assume you're connected or something. So here's, here's why I think this is interesting. If the disks are very small like points, you can almost go in a straight line in Euclidean space to get between the configurations. But now imagine a, a packed configuration and you've just got like one row uh, around the boundary to, to work with, then you can freely permute the disks, but you might, it might take a long time. You have to wiggle them around a lot. So can you show a phase transition in, that, in the geometry in that sense? Don't know. Um, <laughs> other coarse things that we could measure, um, sectional category and LS category are especially suggestive since since those are well known uh, for configuration spaces of, of points. So sectional category is, is what Michael Farber calls topological complexity for motion planning. It's a, you've got a, a map from the path space to X cross X and you wanna find the fewest number of contractible pieces so that you've got sections that, that cover. So, he calls that like that kind of section a motion planning rule. So, um, you know, if we wanted to get really into the topology, it'd be nice to know about equivariant cohomology, um, or Bob pointed out, L2 cohomology might tell us something um, that just cohomology or some homotopy type might not. It might start to detect the geometry, um, you know, like long skinny tendrils that you have to go through to, to get between regions. And of course, the dream would be to understand the phase transition topologically or geometrically. Um, but, um, so I hope I've at least suggested that there are a lot of phase transitions in this topologically, whether or not they're correlated with the, the classical statistical mechanical phase transition. So uh, thanks for your time and attention. Okay.